Hello everyone, and welcome back to another Moxtober Daily Recap. I'm Caillou, joined today by all three of Bradley Rose, Mark Confidant, and Ancestral of MTG.Design. For today's theme, it's going to be Pawn. Uh, we're going to be looking at cards from the MTG.Design Collect Gallery, and uh, cards submitted through LackeyBot on the various discords. Um, if you want to know how to submit your cards to potentially be featured here, check in the description. The description will also have uh, designer credits for all of the cards we talk about today, plus links to the galleries that we're drawing from, which contain all of the submitted cards, which I think is, we're staying at a, at a pretty even 200 cards per day, which is a crazy number. But yeah, um, other than that, uh, I don't know that I have anything to say before we get into the specific designs. Oh, actually, I should probably explain what Moxtober yeah. is, just in case someone's watching this first for the first time. So Moxtober is an annual event in which for each day of the month of October, there's a unique uh, one-word prompt, which people then uh, engage in some sort of creative magic discipline with. Um, the most common one is custom card creation, and that's what we're going to be looking at today, but there are a bunch of other projects. Also, uh, I've heard some people actually be interested in us potentially featuring a non-custom card projects here that people have made from October. So if that's a sentiment that you share, drop a comment and we might consider it for future episodes. But yeah, okay, now we can actually start. So does anyone in particular want to go first? I want Marcus to go first. Okay. <laughs> you, okay. Have been, you, have, you have been nominated. <laughs> Uh, all right, let me pick then. Okay, uh, I'm going to pick an MSC set of three cards designed by Dead. Um, they're Expendable Automaton, Chell Ritualist, and Glorious Martyr. It's uh, kind of a vertical cycle. There's a common, an uncommon, and a rare that all explore the ability word mechanic Gambit, which is um, when this creature dies while attacking or blocking do a thing. So Expendable Automaton is a 2-1. When it dies in combat, you put a plus one, plus one counter on up to one target creature. Shall Ritualist uh, is a... When it dies in combat, you return a creature with mana value 2 or less from your graveyard to the battlefield. And Glorious Martyr is, when it dies in combat, return each other creature you own that died this turn to the battlefield under your control. And then exile it. Um, I really like this in part because... Uh, for an entirely different prompt on Moxtober either last year or the year before, uh, I designed a similar prompt and or I designed a similar mechanic and the idea of conversion mechanics always really appeals to me. Um, mine was templated as dies in combat and it was flavored differently where this one is about sending expendable creatures in to have them die. The one that I did was, uh, the ability word was audacity and the idea was it was creatures that were like swinging in saying to you i dare you to fight me everyone is going to be so mad when i kick the bucket in combat um and i really like that uh there's just a reasonable amount of just very interesting play to this in terms of your opponent has agency over whether this negative thing happens but also um you're incentivized to like put this into the red zone as much as possible mm -hmm. on some of them it can be effectively unblockable but also you can like you're not it's not just opponent dependent since if you have um like a sack outlets you can like construct an archetype around proactively making this uh do some work but yeah it's just it's a, it's a great like uh resonance of flavor and mechanics and it lets you do a lot of cool stuff i'm a big fan and speaking of conversion mechanics there's also there's a custom set called Sferguard, which has um when this dies while attacking, well, when this dies during combat, you transform it, and there are double-faced cards to represent, uh, kind of, and, and the mechanic's name is a uh, glory, so it's basically, uh, kind of uh, in the similar vein of like, yeah, you know what, I'm gonna die here, but then I'm gonna live on forever in Valhalla because it's a Norse-themed set, so. Oh, that's excellent. It does surprise me that that hasn't been a formally explored by uh magic design proper like the the official wizard's magic at all that's a slight surprise to me because so many people are converging on it evidently uh and usually the things that 
a lot of people converge on have at least had some semblance of exploration by wizards with a few small exceptions. Mm. I think it's one of those things where it's a matter of time. But yeah. More more of a win than an if. Mm -hmm. What's kind of interesting is as it's worded, <clears throat> it doesn't necessarily have to die because it was dealt damage. So you could certainly have, you know, combat tricks or, you know, village rights or something like that. It just has to die when it's an attacking or blocking creature. This is a really dweeby thing to enjoy about it, but one thing that I like is it changes the the value on a couple kind of niche uh, limited effects. So, for example, there's sometimes an aura that will grant vigilance. Um, the rate on that probably gets a lot better in a situation where you aren't super worried about two for one yourself or actively want to encourage it. Um, and then also the white removal spell that targets specifically an attacking or blocking creature has a particularly weird sort of like deflator on it in this, similar to that um, the tapping effects that often exist or, or pacifisms in sets that have a pretty big sacrifice theme. But yeah, it just seems like uh, a cool mechanic overall. And I always like when we have a mechanic uh, and there's a spread of cards to show where it could be used again at different rarities, like you said, vertical cycle. So yeah, I know that some people are making sets from October. Uh, I'm definitely from seeing a bunch of, uh, I think they go by dead on Discord and Grey Lotus on MTG.Design. I would definitely be excited if they explored some of this and expanded it into a set either during Moxtober or in the future. But yeah, um, I'm going to go next because I have a transition from talking about multiple cards uh, for to showcase a mechanic. Um, so I'm going to shamelessly steal the spotlight really quick. Um, Sounds like a plan. Mm -hmm. um, this is from the MSE file, and it's a bunch of cards designed by Gateways to show off the minion mechanic, which is essentially a companion variant. So minion, each non-land card in your starting deck has destroy and or draw on its Pinterest rules decks. And you can cast it from your sideboard by sacrificing a creature as an additional cost if it's your chosen minion. And there's basically like a uh, a bunch of like legendary creatures, but the assumption seems to be uh, these would be like limited build arounds. Um, so you have, let's see, you have Evra who protects the end, where the restriction is. Uh, Essentially, everything in your deck has to gain you life in one form or another. Um, there's... Oh, whoops. Wrong one. There's Tayan, who summons the end, who is essentially saying, well, you better be ramping like crazy, and at like seven of sevens is a cool way to represent that. Um, Yev, who revels in the end. Um, your starting deck contains no cards with mana value greater than three, so basically the opposite of Tayan. And then finally, Tarasi, who plots the end, where everything has to have a destroyer draw, so you better be playing control. <laughs> and, and, and as a fun flavor thing, the other card submitted by Gateways is called Bring About the End, um, when all of these other uh, cards, uh, all these other minions, are uh, have, uh, like their, what do you call it? Their epithet um, has blah blah blah, who somethings the end. So, yeah. Love, love the world building here with like, oh, what's, there's not just random minions that's telling a story. I yeah. kind of wish that this was non-token creatures, just so like the, the most obvious abuse case was gone from it. Because like the thing that was dangerous about companions was that it was like having an extra card in your opening hand. And if you had to melt down a creature in order to cast it, then it's a lot more likely to be kind of a, a lateral move on the exchange. Yeah, I think that would be an easy quote-unquote fix that would make this... make make there be, like, a lot more choice slash play to these. So, yeah, I, I would be in favor of that. I think it's a little dangerous having these just being able to be cast from your sideboard. I mean, essentially, I, I think of the lesson cards from Strixhaven, which actually ended up being pretty strong. Uh, the idea is that you just, even though you can cast it right away, the 
the fact that you could go fetch them and fetch which one you wanted was actually good enough. And I'm just wondering if, obviously, like, you know, Gateway 7 made made five of these, but, uh, you know, sideboards could have, like, up to 15 cards in them. So uh, I just wonder if maybe it makes more sense to kind of have to pick and choose and put it in your hand or something like that. I think that... Wait, are you saying, like, your sideboards can have 15 cards and you're worried that someone can have, like, a 15-card sideboard of minions? Sure. Or oh, yeah. can you only have one minion? Am I, am yeah, because when this? it says a chosen minion, that's the kind of a rules text or rules quibble for you can have one of these. in. The oh, companion. okay, you can only have one. All right, well, that would make a big difference then. I, I totally see now. I feel like if I were adding this to, like, magic proper... I would want to create some sort of game mechanical thing that is what companions and minions and anything else with this sort of keyword was that is its own sort of distinction. Like you get to set aside one card in your sideboard that occupies the thing that you cast from outside of the game with a deck construction constraint slot. Mm-hmm. Fair, because like otherwise they they not exponentially stack, but they stack over time as more cards are printed and that's just... Com- even one yeah. companion radically changed the face of how magic is played. Can- yeah. yeah, I'd be for curious the, with superhero set and put a sidekick slot, and now I got sidekick, minion, companion. Mm-hmm. And there's mm-hmm. actually uh, there's a custom set, Dark Seas of Shurian, which has First Mate uh, as uh, its companion variant, where you. Oh, well, there you go. <laughs> yeah, um, you swap it into your opening hand if you meet the... You, you can swap it into your opening hand after mulligans if you meet the condition. Um, that's interesting. But yeah, that's that's one that I think is... It's probably of the companion variants in custom spaces that has been tested the most, and I think the fact that you have to choose it at the start, start of the game, plus the fact that um, it doesn't go card positive, has made it a lot more enjoyable than canon companion. I do, for this specifically, kind of wish that you would sacrifice the creature, put this into your hand, and then you couldn't cast it until the following turn. So there was a kind of pants-down moment when it comes to um, hand hate specifically. Because one of the things that was really rough about minions back before they balanced them was that um, like Thought Seize was totally useless against them. Yeah, for sure. And also just... Like, obviously, uh, like companions, you have to reveal this at the start of the game, but I think it's very easy to perhaps forget about it. And so if, if and like, or like not have it in your evaluation, especially for someone like Yev, who's like, who has haste, your opponent might be like, okay, I'm safe on board. They just have a 1 1. Then they untap, cast this four power haster, and you're like, oh, never mind. So having that thing of like, hey, this is coming up. Yeah, I'm going to be casting this soon is definitely, I think, leads to better gameplay. But yeah, um, in that case, um, Ancestral Bradley, do either of you have a particular preference about who goes next? Sure, well, I can I volunteer. Uh, I volunteer Ancestral to go. All right, I will Power go. move. <clears throat> okay. <laughs> uh, so this one is from uh, the Magic uh, MTG.Design website, and it is Skurzdag Pawn, which is a, it's a creature, human cleric, for a single black mana, uh, a common lifelink. You can tap it to sacrifice Skurstag Pawn, add black black, spend this mana only to cast demon spells. It is a 1-1. One, one. And what I really like about this, it's, there, there's sort of the, this trope of, you know, like these evil clerics summoning, you know, this incredibly powerful demon, right? It's, uh, trying to think of some examples, uh, movies and stuff like that, but the I idea mean, being even, that... Even MTG, what is it? A Shadowborn Apostle? Is that the one? It, absolutely. Right, right. Where you can have any number of them in your deck, you you know, you can you can then search for a demon. And, um, you know, it's it's like these these little guys are worshipping uh, this, this big, imposing demon creature. So I really like that it's, it's kind of a simple design um, at a single mana. The lifelink sort of like 
implies that it's, you know, channeling life, it's stealing life. And um and it kind of has this simple sort of effect where you know you're 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 getting two mana out of it. Kind of reminds me of a really old card, Basil Thrill from from back in the mid nineties. But uh but just that flavor, if honestly, if it wasn't for demon spells to cast demon spells, I think just adding that in there just made it way better. Especially since I think with one man acceleration outside of green, it can sometimes be scary. But since demons are all naturally or like usually very expensive, like they're certainly like four cost demons in magic, but the vast majority of them are like six to seven. It makes this less worrying as like early, early ramp. It's more like you cash it in. You have this one drop that you can cash in later for value. And I think that makes it a lot more interesting and dynamic in black in black. Well, so this puts you up to mana the way that Dark Ritual does, because you get to wait a turn before using it. But also, because it's a tap ability and you can't use it immediately, um, you end up kind of having like a suspend ramp spell, if that makes sense, a suspend mana ritual. And I like that there's this navigation uh, of demon spells right as you mentioned uh caillou cost more naturally uh but sometimes you won't draw your demon cards and to avoid that feel bad uh the the lifelink here is a great um mechanical uh reward and feel good for why you're playing this turn one you still haven't drawn a demon but it's doing something useful if i didn't have lifelink Paying a black mana just for a 1-1, one, one, oh, it feels really bad. Um, and one more point with the human type instead of something like vampire, like it really does, like as uh, as you were saying, Ancestral, you tell that story of like you're actually maybe drawing blood from other people that you're like sacrificing or creatures or something like that. I think that the Scars Dog are specific, uh, they're cult on Innistrad, I think, uh, if I remember right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. Mm-hmm. But yeah, like, and I think I mentioned this last episode, I think it's really easy to, d- to design rares and mythics. It's really hard to design compelling commons. And I think that that's why I love this, because with three lines of text, it makes this really compelling package, both mechanically and flavorfully. And a one drop, no less, because one drops are usually, like, not very valuable and limited. And this gives you a one drop that I, I if I saw this, I would be like, oh, okay. I know what archetype I want to draft. So, big fan. Uh, shout out to Cyber5. I didn't mention Cyber5 is the designer of this card. Hell yeah. You rule Cyber5. I think we all we featured one of their cards earlier. So, on a roll. Ooh. And now, I nominate Bradley to go next. <laughs> <laughs> Goodness gracious. Okay, let's jump over to Magic Set Editor Land with the card named Pawn by MB Tree. Uh, this, well, first of all, reminds me of the Trash for Treasure space that Red does of uh, getting some artifact. But in this case, it's not another object. You're getting money. And red is the color of getting fast mana or treasures. In this case, it's so, it's like one word, Card names are are a um, not like if you were to think about the the theory of namespace uh, are not to be uh, used uh, frivolously. So when you have such a simple effect, the pair with a one word name, I think this right here, pawn, is a a chef kiss moment of pairing this uh, effect with this word name. I can't wait to pawn my mirror enforcer and feed all that treasure to my atog. <laughs> oh yes. All oh, the affinity for artifacts. You're you're sneaky. Like it keeps you keep generating value. And those are both on the set Mirrodin too. Yeah. So I guess pawn shops on Mirrodin just do brisk business. <laughs> this also has strong synergy with a lot of the treasure cards that we've seen lately. And most, this is mostly like Commander, but Revel and Riches and such like that. So 
just creating more treasure is more good. Um, I do like that this is a sorcery, not an instant, because um, it's, I think, harder to play around this if it is an instant. And also, it takes some time to pawn. Like, if you've ever gone to a pawn shop or if you've ever tried to sell something or barter, like, it takes some time. You don't just instantly get the money. Um, although, I would argue in real life, you know, it would probably be like, X treasures divided by two, you know, like you, you don't always get a really good value for the thing you 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 pawn at the pawn shop. Good point. I I do definitely agree. Instant speed would be really worrisome, especially in EDH, where it's like you go to the, the opponent uphill of use end step and you're like, I'm going to pawn my eight drop and then I'm going to start my critical turn with um probably 16 mana available to me because I was able to afford the 8 drop in the first place. Maybe even more. Yeah, that's a good point. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't know that I have much to add. It's just, a, it's just a cool card. And I think it's really punchy for uh, what Pawn is trying to convey. So, yeah, I'm a fan. Anytime anyone gets away with using a one-word name and everyone feels like, yeah, yeah, take that name. You know they've done something right. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we're back around to you, Mark. Full circle. Um, speaking of cards with the word pawn on them, let's go to a card designed by Cajun in the MSC files. Collateral Companion. Uh, it's one in a red for a 2-1. When you cast a non-creature spell, you can pay one in a red or pawn Collateral Companion. If you do, Collateral Companion deals two damage to target opponent. Um, I really like the idea of you're selling your creature off in order to get an effect that you can't afford right now. Um, it's just really flavorful of like, I'm going <laughs> to sell my cute little pet uh, to some random schmuck in order to be able to shock this now. Um, and then also is very cute with the blinkiness of it. You can like chump block with collateral companion, bolt them, and then you send collateral companion to a nice farm upstate for a little while before you get it back. Yeah, I, I really think... like that it's. Oh, I was gonna say I really like that it's a gremlin. Uh, it <laughs> if if uh, if if you were around, if you ever watched the old gremlin gremlins movies, but it's. You know, just this little kind of adorably cute little thing. But then, you know, the, the claws are just kind of starting to show there. Um, so I, I, I just find that fantastic. Wasn't that how it was like Gremlin was obtained somehow this way? Was it through, a, through some shop or something or no? Yeah, like a mysterious store. I want to say like the store owner gives the person advice on Gremlins is the conceit of the movie. And then um, they just blow through all of that advice and everything bad happens. Yeah, something about, like, don't let them near water or something. I've never watched the movie, but it's just such a cultural touch to touchstone. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I like the balancing against uh, the comparison with um, Gutter Snipe. Uh, that's just instant sorceries for Gutter Snipe, and this one's not creature, but it's kind of close. Um, but uh, having it be one in a red instead of two in a red means you get you got to do a little more work, a little more hustle for uh, your two damage that you like. Although I guess it's target opponent. Maybe that's still, you know, fine for limited uh, wise. Yeah, Firebrand Archer, there's a few of these. But um, I do like that it you, you're you forced to do one or the other. It's not like an optional, eh, you can pay this man if you want. And it's like, you either pay it or you lose the companion. Gotta which make is a very, deal. feels very red. Oh, um, actually, this when I act, I asked a clarifying question, Cajun, when I saw this. Oh, no, um, it is you may pay. Uh, yeah. yeah, well, yeah. go ahead. Yep, yeah, you can uh, decide not to do anything, um, but you just won't get the damage. But uh, it's cool that you can pay using one or the other, like in real life, right? You can pay money, mana, or give away your valuable gremlin, uh, and then you still get a reward of two damage. Return to barter system. I do... <laughs> <laughs> decline capitalism return to barter system <laughs> i do wonder what this looks like with higher price differentials for pawning things so like when you have a creature where it's like 
four mana total to pawn it. Like, if imagine if this was, instead of to target opponent, it was any target, but you had to pay four mana or let go of it for a while. Um, then you end up with this, like, thing that's kind of a value engine, but it's a very, very slow value engine, because getting it back takes, like, not only, um, like, paying four mana as a sorcery for a 2-1, but then you probably are going to have to pay uh, even more to get the the effect again, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. That's a good point. How well does it scale out to other cards? Do you like that um, Pawn isn't explicitly tied to the mana cost of the creature? Um because that that gives you some like bonus knobbiness on this. You can pay such and such or pawn this. Or maybe there are cards where it's like um like a Ophidian style effect where it's like you hit your opponent in the face, you can pawn this. Um if you do, you get to draw a card, and then like you you get it back with some other cost. Okay, next up, continuing uh, red cards that are all about exchanging stuff, um, we're going to go to uh, Rasmus Persistent Pawner from the MTG.Design cards. Um, and it's two in a red for legendary creature human peasant, and you can pay two in a red to have target opponent gain control of a target permanent you control. You draw a card and create a treasure token, and at the beginning of each opponent's upkeep, they sacrifice each permanent they control but don't own. I like this as a kind of politics piece plus Zedru adjacent, like, here, have this. I think they probably did at the beginning of the upkeep to prevent some of the weirder stuff that Zedru can do, but I, too, I, I like this card with a caveat that I think I would like it more if uh, it sacrificed on end step, so they, so that, because I think there's some times where you can just kind of um, give it to them at the beginning of the previous player into turn orders end step, and then it's just like, well, that was just two red draw a card, make a treasure, um, and they usually won't get a chance to actually use it. Um, while if they get a full main, full two main phases slash combat phase, maybe they can put together something interesting. Um, and the other In thing that... is, oh sorry, and the other thing is, I think. It creating treasure tokens to give itself more fuel to for permanence because it doesn't say non-token so you can just keep making treasures and either sacking it to, to make the ability two mana or just have that be the permanent you donate um i think it's maybe a little bit too self engine but yeah other than that i think this is a really cool uh donate style commander i will further when it comes to the end step clause instead of upkeep i think it should be each player's upkeep that would play interestingly with active trees and effects on this. And this already plays okay with active trees and effects because you can donate something you've active treasoned. But I like the idea of um, having the option of either active treasoning something and knowing it's going to be thrown away, or active treasoning something, laundering it into a card and some money, and then knowing that whoever gets it is going to throw it away. What's funny is if you pawn itself. Yeah. Yeah. Someone Armageddon's it's like, well, if you float man in response, well, I've got nothing left to sell. <laughs> I guess you could activate it right away. So that, that could get kind of crazy <laughs> if the opponent has red mana. Mm. Oh, yeah. Should this be a tap ability, like rate limit it a little bit? Or is it just like, is Wombo comboing off your part of the appeal of this guy? I don't know. I think it's one of those things where, like, a little playtesting would probably reveal it. But there's enough knobs that I, I feel I feel comfortable that the design seed can be taken to a reasonably playable place, I guess. It it's is also... mono-red. If, if you're playing commander, then you're stuck with one color. I think that a yeah. spicy, non-combat mono-red commander is very hard to do and is done pretty well here, even if there's, like, slight notes that we would want to play with in order to figure out what the actual like final composition of this should be like it still looks really strong on its face in terms of appeal of the design uh, the the name persistent uh 
we would want to see what the intent of is how persistent are you? Is it once uh, per turn and you keep going every round? Or is it that uh, I pay two in a red and I net a card and treasure, but then I could pay two in a red again and trade away my treasure if I want or another thing and uh, keep going in the same turn? Uh, how persistent is this pawner? Yeah, uh, shout out to Nicole Goatless, who is the designer of this card. Um, yeah. Is it Go Atlas or Goatless? I would assume it's Goatless, but it could be Goatless. Oh, Go it sounds like Golas. Yeah, oh. yeah. <laughs> but yeah, unless anyone else has anything to say. Ancestral, what's your next card? Okay, uh, so I've got on the mtg.design website... Uh, Gang Muscle, I think this uh, uh, person submitted a redesign, so it's going to be the the first one towards the top. Um, but it is a creature human rogue. It is an uncommon card. It is, costs one black mana. At the beginning of your end step, if you control no legendary creatures, sacrifice Gang Muscle. It's a 4-4. Four, four. Uh, the flavor text is, this organization is built on one principle, loyalty so i i really like the whole flavor behind this it the idea being you know if you're if you're a powerful person if you were a, a notable lord right you probably have people fighting for you you can afford you know those those mercenaries and meanwhile those mercenaries they're not going to fight unless they're getting paid so uh, i think it really shines through here if you no longer have the legendary creature, that that noble, that lord, that that imposing figure, well, um, you know, however weak they might be in combat, then the gang muscle will just go away itself. So it's um, probably you won't be able to get it out super quick because there's usually not that many legendary creatures, you know, turn two, turn three. But uh, uh, so there's a little bit of of po it, it, it's that potential value that's so enticing. Uh, but I uh, I think it's I think it's relatively balanced here, all things considered. Yeah, the dream is obviously uh, turn one Ismaru, turn two double gang muscle pass, turn three swing for ten. Um, but even then, a single removal spell uh, can put you down two or even three cards. So um, it's very interactable. Um, and the fact that you can't just run this out, like run this out turn one, makes it a lot more like a lot more reasonable. It's just yeah, it's just a fun build around. Um, and I think the end step version is kind of cheeky because if you have uh, flash uh, legendary creatures, you can just if your opponent removes one and is like okay I'm safe, then you just flash in another one. It's like no. I I got uh and a bigger not a bigger um. A potential other dream that you could do, um, which is you for a commander, um, you use Rograk, the Kobold that costs zero partner, along with the Black Identity partner, uh, and then you can do this turn one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's yeah. the tech right there. Exciting. Here's a question. I think you could Rograk and then. Um... Mox Amber and play this out and give it haste and hit for four on turn one if you want it as well. Oh gosh. The dream. <laughs> now we're playing with power. We're not even at the prompt dream yet and we, we're, we're dreaming. Yeah, okay. Now it's your turn, Bradley. Okay, uh, over in mtg.design land. We've got Instrument of War. Uh, this is uh, the, my, what do you call it? Uh, my smiley card here. Mm. One that, go, oh my gosh. <laughs> um, so, it, so first of all, yes, it does the chess thing where uh, your pawn makes it to the other side of the board. You can become a piece, a game piece of your choice. And the choice is here. But one of the choices... Uh, is uh, becoming a knight with horsemanship, and I, uh, <laughs> bringing back horsemanship meaningfully here uh, just made me really smile. Mm -hmm. 
think there was another one of these style of cards on, I believe, uh, MSE that had the same sort of... Oh, no, 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 it was also an MTG.design um, that had the same sort of transforming into things. And that one brought black, back flanking. So I like that there's some desire to just give the knight one of these weird abilities and have them just be doing ye old magic medieval style. <laughs> And it fits like it's so it's funny that in yeah, in chess they are the trickiest ones and so giving flanking or horsemanship are like some of the weirdest abilities you could the that you could give the most tricky. So it all just gels together. Mm -hmm. Um shout out to the first line of exerting as it attacks. It kind of makes that feeling of how uh, pawns, once you move them forward, you can't move them backwards, unlike other pieces. But it's, a, you know, they'll eventually untap, so then it feels like they're retreating back, um, but uh, that's cool little, like, note there. It, it also is a cool balancing thing, so it's not just like your opponent is forced to have removal turn one, or it suddenly turns into like, like, yeah, like a 3-3 three, three with first strike, or a 3-1 with horsemanship are both pretty pretty difficult to deal with. The exert gives them a little more time to either chip in with creatures or do something or find an answer. So, yeah, very good point. Yeah. That was designed by Kaber. Okay, I think it's Kaber Wiki Wikijack, but that... yeah. Oh, there we go. Yeah, my my eyes, I guess. Uh, thank you. Okay, uh, next up, um, going to be looking at uh, Queen's Gambit from uh, the MTG.design side of things. Um, and I kind of, I like this card mechanically a lot, is mostly my thing. I'm not sure that it does an amazing job of like capturing the like chess flavor as well as some of these other cards, but I love uh, the idea of cards that get better as you cast them more times and here the payoff is something that's really strong but still a single removal spell beats it so it's not like something like um whatever the seven drop from uh amon Ket was that everyone hated as a control win con um but yeah so you get you get to create a one one white pawn normally which is slightly underrated. you usually get like two tokens uh for this cost with the sorcery speed but if it's the fourth, fourth time you've cast a spell this game, you get an 8-8 eight, eight legendary white queen with first strike, lifelink, and vigilance. And so I like this thing of like, oh, so can I recur this card? Like you put in like a regrowth style effects to like get it back. Um, and just, or like uh, stuff that lets you um, cast copies. So you can get extra, not just copies it, but it lets you cat, like copy it and then cast the copy. Um, just, like, yeah, lots of, like, I feel like there's lots of, like, cheeky ways to make it so you don't have to draw all four copies to actually have this go off. So, yeah, it makes the Johnny and me, uh, makes the gear start turning. So, yeah, big fan. Shout out to a literal onion. Do <laughs> you think that the fair mode of this should be better as far as things go? Is a 1-1 one, one white pawn, um, do you think that it needs to be that level of weaker than your average two mana card in order to make the success case of casting this several times um into a real case or into like a balanced card i don't know i, I think this could be one mana i'm not gonna lie mm -hmm. do you think yeah. it could be like two or three mana make two one ones sure but i think it's more interesting the cheaper it is because it lets you again like play around with regrowth or cast copy effects in a you know i i really want this to be like shuffled back in the library or like put you know kind of like um approach of the second sun sort of thing uh you know put so or however many from the top i feel like i feel like that would be a lot of fun like hey i'm gonna get this back it's gonna be a couple turns but you know i'm almost there yeah, it reminds me of a similar card from a set called Love Song. Um, it's two and a white instant, and then you gain five life. Um, 
and then if you've cast the, if you've cast spells named well I forget the name of the card I think it's uh, something the stars if you cast them five times this game you win the game but um, it has this thing where if you've spent five colors of mana on spells this turn you get to shuffle it back into your library so it has this auto uh, auto way of making it so that you can actually cast five spells in a game as long as you're actually running a five color deck so th- oh, wonderful. I agree it would be cool to yeah, like raise the alarms instant speed, right? And maybe you could say that's a little above rate for like nowadays they might uh shy away from instant speed, raise the alarm. Um but so sorcery create two pawns means you get the starting chessboard of eight pawns. Shuffling could be cool or not. Uh depends on what you want the vision to be if you wanna encourage recursion from your graveyard. But love the eight eight shout out to the Eight by eight board. It's great. There's four sides to a board. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> now I'm just for reading all the uh, numbers mm-hmm. into it, like the movie 23, which I've never seen. <laughs> but. but yeah. Um, next up, it's you, Mark. Uh all right, my next card is also from uh, mtg.design, and it is Burn Through the Specimens. Oh, wait, did we just, Mi- or did Mark just go, and I'm and I'm mixing up the you, order? You went, and now I go, because I think uh, there's a slight swap in the order there. It's not a big deal, though. Okay, okay, my bad then. Yeah, go ahead. No worries. Um, so Burn Through the Specimens is whenever you sack a creature to cast a spell or activate an ability, Copy that speller ability. You may choose new targets for the copy. So I think um, one of the things that I thought was going to show up in the pawn stuff a little bit more than the dead, and it did some, is expendability. And I think this one really highlights that in a cool way. The idea of, okay, now I'm really, really incentivized to have as many things that cause me to sack a creature um, as possible. Mm-hmm. Yeah, like this was also on my list because it just seems like such a dope build around. Um, And yeah, I think the wording might need to be changed a little just to work in the rules. But yeah, I I, I really like this card. I also love in the flavor text, it it shouts out Beebles. We we love Beebles in this house. And I also love that the designer's name is Discourser of Crufix, which is uh, a badumch worthy pun if I've ever heard one. As opposed to that courser of crucifix. Oh no, just courser of crucifix and versus discourse and or just coursing. I think that's the pun. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm just messing. Don't worry. Crucifix um, needs uh, those to speak at the Theros debates for on their behalf. Um, but yeah, this this seems like the sort of card where there's like a smattering of EDH decks that this would just go in and they'd be super happy to have it because they're melting down their creatures at a moment's notice. Oh, yeah. Yeah, aristocrats and all that. Mm-hmm. Um, I like the the tagging of, like, oh, sacrificing creatures is, like, a black thing. Uh, that, that Therefore, when you anchor it in sacrifice, you can get away with things that you might normally see in blue and red uh, for copying things. Yeah, this is super. Uh, it immediately, like, I always think of like, how can I abuse this card? Like, what can I, uh, you know, how can I get like the most value? Uh, like, for example, copying uh, effects that let you draw cards. You know, village rights for four kind of thing. Um, so, Ooh. but it it does cost four mana to put on the board, uh, and you know there there's still a cost whenever you have to sacrifice a a creature. Although, um, yeah, like certainly if there were spells or creatures that, let's see, it's just it's just any spell, right? Yeah, or any yeah. ability, or any ability. Uh, so you know, if there was a uh, like Torgar or one of these creatures that you know comes in the battlefield and causes your opponents to lose life, uh, then um, uh, I, I'm assuming it's sacrifice one or more creatures, right? I yeah. Oh, hold on. You've just highlighted a really great case. This can copy creature spells. Oh, yeah. yeah. 
And no, that's possible that's nowadays. Filthy. Wow. Huh. <laughs> that's sweet as hell. Wait, so wait, does sac does devour count as sacrificing a creature to cast a spell? Uh, devour is a replacement effect that changes how it enters the battlefield, so sadly, this would not be affected no. with it. No! Okay, so what you're saying is we immediately have to reword this so that it works with that. Gotcha, gotcha. I mean, that would be sweet. And calling back to another card that we talked about, this does copy Pawn. And, talking back to a card that I just deeply enjoy, that means that you can double Pawn and then double a Tog each of the treasure tokens that you Pawn. Goodness. Hmm. Uh, we really brewing in this episode today. Oh, and then you can and then you can double fling the double a tog, the really swole a tog, and you'll fling it at two players. Double fling, oh my goodness! Um, the ancestral you mentioned uh, whether one or more. It, it says it does not say one or more, so that actually is a good point. Where if you do sacrifice three creatures to uh, maybe cast that demon that you want to, uh, um cast with all that sweet black mana that you also happen to have sacrificed that other anyway yes uh that means it will copy it like three times so maybe <laughs> do one or more as a little control valve yeah that's good because otherwise shadowborn apostle would be tutor up six demons <laughs> or seven yeah. demons i guess it's a lot of demons <laughs> Yeah, um, next up is you, Ancestral. All right. Um, so I've got a card on the uh, mtg.design website, uh, and it is reaching the eight rank. So kind of with these with with some of these prompts, there's multiple ways to interpret, you know, the definition, the meaning. So this is the the chess version, which I think we had one of these before, but um, I, I, I like reaching the eight rank. Um, so it, it is one black, an instant. As an additional cost is to cast this spell, sacrifice a creature with power two or less, and search your library for a cleric, knight, artifact, or noble card, and put it onto the battlefield. Um, before I forget, this was uh, designed by Tag003. And uh, if you've played chess, uh, so the, the thing you don't often get to do, but it happens occasionally, Move your pawns, you know, one step at a time. Eventually, you get all the way to the end of the board, which is the eighth rank. And you can basically choose whatever piece you want. Now, most of the time you play chess, you're just going to take the queen, because the queen's the most powerful piece by far. Uh, but you know, in some limited cases, you might, uh, you know, take like a knight, or you might just get kind of cocky and be like, Psh, all I need is a, is a bishop. I don't care about anything else. So you get your choice uh, of, you know, cleric for the bishop, the knight, the artifact, which I guess would be the rook, which is like the little castle guy. Um, the noble card's obviously the, the queen. So the, the flavor just works, uh, you know, right there. A pawn is a really small creature, power two or less. So um, uh, maybe it's a little bit powerful for a, for a common instant, but I think, uh, I think the, uh, the card is uh, really well designed. And it sounds like it probably common was just filled in as the default rarity because of the complexity of what it's doing. So, personally, I would swap uh, artifact with wall, just because um, artifact is really, really broad. And mm -hmm. sure, if you, yeah. If you specify those four creature types, then all of a sudden you have this pretty interestingly constraining thing where you've got some strong stuff, but nothing that's like super mind blowing. You've got like Provax or like Gladeheart Cavalry or um let's see here. Garza Zol Plague Queen is a noble apparently. Um and you've just got some like some spicy choices to make along that front. I do I, I think the the one change I would make would be I feel like Maybe it would be better if the if you hmm, if the creature if it somehow triggered like when the creature uh, attacked your opponent. So like you know like on the chessboard you bring the piece all the way to the end. So maybe you should be able to like have to be able to get in for damage with that small creature first. Yeah. So sacrifice a creature that 
like with power or like whenever you deal combat damage whenever a creature deals combat damage to an opponent or to a player uh, with power two or less you may sacrifice it or something like that yeah okay and bradley what's your next card okay let us go with magic set editor uh on Passant, which is listed as designed by I M I E M C D Ian. Um, this one, let's see. The move on Passant, of course, popular move, classic. Uh, usually that is achievable when your opponent has pushed their pawn too far. So that's reflected with having the the tapped creature. Uh, they made that mistake that they could have just not tapped their creature and you wouldn't have been um, able to do so. Of course, there's also the other um, decision point that they didn't block your attacking creature. And But once you set up those conditions, you got them on Passant. And I, I think this it feels like uh, just like when you move right next to them and you can on Passant them. This is a, a great feeling. Yeah, and I think that it it's one of those cards which I think when translating mechanics from one game to another can easily become clunky, but the utility here seems really solid. Like It feels like I can definitely see play patterns where like um, your opponent taps out to swing at you, then on the backswing you go and you're like, well actually I'm going to have my random 5-5 five five, uh, deal, my random 5-5 five five common deal 5 damage to your bomb. Uh, you didn't expect that from white, did you? Um, <clears throat> it's it, and it's like it's it's a it's a reasonable way to do white fight, it, which is a crazy thing to say, but it really is just like it makes sense because it doesn't like specifically violate because they they still have to attack first, and so you could have killed it with a destroy target attacking creature or whatever. So there's like. I feel like the, the play patterns isn't outside of White's realm, and it just adds like a cool, flavorful little tidbit in there. Yeah, I think White can bite or fight tapped creatures. I think there's no rule against it. It's using the yeah, using the power of. He can have it. Yeah, I as guess normally White has like destroy target uh, tapped creature, right? And this is like a a long version of doing that, but it's it's good that it's not just saying. Uh, uh, a creature you control deals damage equal to its power to another creature. That would be that would be like, oh, that's just feels green. Um, so, uh, anchoring it in the tactic strength of white is now it's like, okay, cool. Uh, either you use your numbers for Kabira takedown um, to do a bite, or you mm -hmm. do tactical uh, moves, and then you can do a white bite. I yeah. Do it... mm -hmm. Go ahead. Oh, I was just gonna say, no, you're right. I mean, if if it if it dealt straight up damage, it would be Feral Zealot, <laughs> which <laughs> which was what uh, Wizards uh, before they knew how to design uh, sets. So, uh, no, I I I I think it works. Uh, I was gonna say, I think um, you could just have an unblocked attacking creature deal damage equal to its power. I think I don't think that in on passant, I guess you do sort of lose out on. No, because you still move forward on the board. So I think conceptually, having it just deal damage equal to its power to a tapped creature is fine. Um, and then it, it reduces a little bit of the unintuitiveness of this. Maybe it kind of necessarily has to be unintuitive to fully capture stuff. But I think I don't mind it just being um, target unblocked attack creature you control bites target tapped creature you don't control. It's a philosophical discussion here on what feels on Pisani. Okay, and this is mm -hmm. going to be the last round of designs we're going to talk about today. Um, so load up your uh, favorite designs. And, you know, I'm going to so graciously give all of you time to do that, and I'll start off with my last design. <laughs> um, it's going to be from the MSC file, Queen Making, the second one, by Gynoid Poet. Um, 
It's a one white for an instant. Whenever target creature you control deals combat damage to a player this turn, if it attacked alone, put a double strike counter on it. It becomes a noble in addition to its other types. And yeah, this just feels like we've seen a bunch of designs today that represent this idea of getting to the other side of the board. And I think this one uh, expresses it in a way that feels very like, like it doesn't need to list off a bunch of attributes. It doesn't need to do a bunch of stuff. It's just a straightforward uh, pseudo combat trick that has a little bit of flavor, t uh, mechanical flavor text in there. So um, I'm, a I'm mostly attracted to the mechanical simplicity of this and how it uses and how it uses a few line of lines of text to convey something that's like flavorfully uh, kind of complex. So yeah, big fan. Also I love the flavor text here. So if you had a creature with first strike and it deals the combat damage First, then you could cast Queen Making, and then it would attack, get in for damage the second time, right during the same combat, right? Yes, that is wild. I, I have no idea actually if that's right or not. I forget whether a creature needs to have had double strike during the first strike step in order for you to get to second strike, and have it having double strike cause it to deal damage on the second strike. I would literally need to go into like the comp right. rules because. That's a that's a a brain breaker right there. I'm I'm sure they weren't thinking of that uh, when they designed this. Um, but uh, but I do like the the fact that hey, you know you. I, I I guess I guess when I when I think of this, I don't know if maybe this isn't what they were intending, but I I guess I think of someone who, um, did really well in combat. Like they succeeded, right? They they survived or got promoted or whatever and basically they're a better warrior now but obviously i don't think that's what they're going for because they become a noble um so maybe it's they've retired and become a noble but um i mean i think it's, it's, a, cool I art, think it's like battlefield noble because the flavor text is like no one could deny her worth and like the mechanic the confluence of mechanics feels like uh kind of a combination of exalted where it has to attack alone but also renowned because when it deals combat damage you get a little bit of a buff up, so I think I think it's it's a battlefield monarch, or maybe like a Joan of Arc kind of thing. Yep, yep. Oh, kind of have the queen be powerful. Um, I like the alone part. Like it, it is a good effort thing to do to get. Uh, but yeah, it, it would it helps feel the chess thing. You, you can only. You always attack alone. You're always exalted in the game of chess. It is very strategic. Uh, when when to attack and you know bringing that playing that spell. But yeah. Okay, Mark. What's your last card for the day? My last card is an MSC card designed by Elry. It is Intrepid Investigator slash Abyssal Monstrosity. Um. I liked a couple things about this card. One is it feels very much like the pawn of an Eldritch Horror, um, a very Innistrad sort of vibe of like, there's this horrible monster that I'm trying to look into as far as things go, but then it turns out that I was a piece of its uh, elder machinations all along. Um, so it's it's a disturbed card with Skulk, and um, when it enters battlefields or attacks, it mills a card got a seven mana disturbed cost and then on the back side it can't be blocked by creatures with lesser power and when it enters the battlefield or attacks you may put target creature card from a graveyard onto the battlefield tapped under your control additionally uh and i don't know whether this was intentional or not but unlike most disturbed cards it keeps coming back it doesn't when it dies on the back side it doesn't become exiled I think that might have been intentional, and I like the idea of like an Eldritch Horror just keeps coming and keeps coming. Um, and I also like Skulk on the front half because one of the things that I had thought about when it comes to pawns is the idea like the pawns move first or the pawns move under all the big pieces, if that makes sense. Their structure matters a little bit, but they kind of go beneath notice when you're thinking about like 
most other stuff, despite them being kind of an important piece or kind of like the foundational piece. Mm -hmm. And the front side is actually uh, for mystery, it looks like. This is a DFC for double prompts. So oh, yeah. The twist. They were yeah. like, you don't know what's coming next. Oh, it was, uh, they were a pawn this whole time. That is extremely spicy. I love it. Mm. <laughs> I kind I, of wish uh, Abyssal Monstrosity was like, the, its its power and toughness was equal to the number of cards in all graveyards or something like that. Just just make it like really hammer in the thing of like, yeah, when you're milling a card, you're really fueling this Eldritch Horror. But that might be like having like a 2020 that also brings back creatures might be a little much for a seven drop, but I want that flavor. But yeah. Uh, I like that. Um, or sorry. Uh, when you mentioned whether it was intentional to have the exile clause, um, I think all the disturbs are uh, ghosts, if I remember correctly, in Mi Midnight Hunt. So, because this isn't a ghost, maybe that clues it. Yeah, they were totally thinking of, let's not do it. Let's let them be summonable again. Yeah, when it when it well, dies, it's just sinking beneath the waves, waiting to surface once more. And to like dip into Lovecraft stuff, like the the bit that we see of like an eldritch monstrosity is kind of just like it dipping its pinky toe into our world. So, you know, like, if you if you cut off somebody's pinky toe, they can still dip another toe in. It's not really that impactful of a thing to send, to beat it back, even. Yes. I, now I just want an, I just want an eldritch monster that's like, so-and-so, the thousand toad, or something like that. <laughs> there you go. It just reminds me of a, of a magic item in a D&D &D thing that I I read about recently where um, it just gives you the ability to have any number of fingers that you choose to have. Ooh, okay. It's a, it's a little under like, but you buy you can you can be like, oh, I want to play this loop really well, so I'm gonna have like ten fingers on each hand. Or just you can be crazy good at pickpocketing. Yeah. But yeah, okay, ancestral. What's gonna be your last card for the day? Sure, so this is in the MSC file. This is Useful Pawn, uh, which is an enchantment aura. Uh, it costs one blue-blue enchant creature. You control enchanted creature. Enchanted creature has base power and toughness 1-1. One, one. The flavor text is Checkmate, and it's designed by 3-Pawn OMG. The, the artwork here, it shows a... I guess you'd, it'd be like a rogue or, or warrior or something. He's got a blade and sticking his hand out but it honestly looks like a a, a board game piece you know if it, if um, it the full it, art it, it, is a chess piece actually it, um, it's a chess piece they, okay. I, I know because i don't know how we keep doing this but um this is actually one of the arts i'm using for the thumbnail so when i looked it up i was oh, like oh yeah the bottom go. the bottom half the bottom half is like a little circular base i actually mm -hmm. know what this art is from in part because i know who the artist is um, so this is a magic artist who went on to design some Hearthstone art, and this is from, oh gosh, I want to say this like side Hearthstone thing that exists where you can like kind of play a bizarro version of chess on Hearthstone. Auto chess? I think it's World of Warcraft auto chess, but I may well, be wrong. So this is like just like um, some side mission thing or another. It's not an auto chess thing so much as it is like you start out with a board state of Hearthstone cards. And each of the different Hearthstone cards has constraints on how it can attack, um, like whether it hits like the minions to the side I, of it. Or I remember, I remember what you're talking about when I played Hearthstone like years ago. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. It's a um, good art. Good job. I want to. Yeah. I want to say this also. Either this or this whole like cycle of chess pieces that was that Zoltan Boros did were i think the most frequently used art for this day which is also why i ended up choosing it for the thumbnail yeah. perfect all right so okay, also wait, wait, quick correction um the designer is just omg uh three pawn as i'm assuming just it's day three of moxtober the prompt is ah pawn. sure uh, i was just gonna say one more thing here because we haven't actually really talked about the card um it's <laughs> For three mana, it's, a, I think, a little aggressive uh, for stealing a creature in that 
depending on what the creature is, it might not matter if it's a 1-1. One, one. We might have had something similar. I feel like I've talked about a similar card before, but um, maybe that, or maybe I saw someone else design basically the same kind of card. But um, uh, but it's not too outrageous. I mean, it, basically, we've got kind of control magic sort of uh, mana costs at about four or five. So um, uh, I think it'd be a blast to have. I think just, you know, it's like taking the really big guy with some cool abilities and just shrink them all down to a 1-1. One, one. It's sort of like, you know, the turn to frog sort of, uh, you know, effects uh, that that we see in, in some of the, the sets, you know, turning a big thing to a small thing, but it still has the other abilities. Yeah, like that yeah. reference to turn to frog, it... This feels like a card that I would expect to have already been printed in canon at some point, and I mean that entirely as a compliment. Where it's just like, it's such a simple but evocative combination of iconically blue effects that you find on auras. Ancestral. Ancestral, I think the card that you're thinking of that we talked about previously was the the buyback spell that makes all the frogs? Uh, Maybe that's it. (laughs) Um, And I do think this is really good uh... for blue. Oh, it was it was a custom card from one of the days, Bradley. I think it was the first or oh, second. Okay. It, it, it was one, it was yeah. riveting rebirth from day one. Okay, okay, not mm-hmm. polymorph suggest where it does turn everyone into one once. Okay, all right. Yeah. Um, but yeah, go ahead, Marcus. Um, because we we had talked about how like having base power and toughness like one one when you get turned into a frog isn't a big deal if you come in with like a crazy amount of counters on you, so you can like use this on a Hydra, and then you steal their 6-6 six, six Hydra, and it's a 7-7, seven, seven, and they shed a single tier because you get it really uh, easily. Um, I do think that, like, the three-mana mind control effect that has some significant drawback is a cool category of card, in my opinion. Um, it, there's maybe an argument to be made that blue shouldn't get something that is kind of, sort of, a sorcery speed murder for three-mana. Um, but I'm not sure how much I side with that argument because it's more like a like an O-ring with upside. Yeah, I, I was I was gonna say um, to your I can, now to your point also, Marcus, but also to Ancest- ancestral pointing out the power level of this is that I think uh, like we have capture sphere, which uh, that's funny capturing in chess happens, uh, which is two blue and one you tap it and it's down for the rest of the game unless you do something to it. Um, and I think the same tools are still present when you use this. However, because you gain this, I would want this to be if you want it mana value three, it would be it's got to be three blue or bump up the cost for getting some spicy extra abilities potentially. Mm hmm. I think I'm a defender of this at one blue blue, mainly especially at rare because we do have control magic at two UU, and I think that. I think that, uh, for constructed relevant removal, most of the time you like these days we're getting good constructed relevant removal, at uh, one black or one white in instant speed, so I think that like, it's not gonna break the pie that much because running a removal that's one mana slower plus sorcery speed um, end up being significant downsides in a lot of cases. So, yeah, I'm I, I'm, I'm team one blue-blue useful pawn. I can see the arguments for why blue-blue-blue or a higher cost would make sense, but I think that comparing the effect to current rates, I'd be cool with it at this cost. Yeah. When's the last time that a mind control effect has been playable in Standard? The only one I can think of is Domestication from Theros RTR. Um, there was the, no, there was the, the big one. Um, I don't think it was, uh, the one that, uh, it was like an X spell and you can gain control of a bunch of stuff. And there's also agent of treachery, though. None of those are really oh. auras. Though none of those are really auras. So the play pattern of, and slash interactability of them is different, but yeah, yeah, there was the, there was the mind control on a dude that you could, uh, cheat in and also it hit anything. And then the other one, the mass manipulation played with the, um, Whatever the green untapped spell is, so you could cast it for a gajillion. Yeah, and it also hit planeswalkers, so there was no way Ooh. to like. Uh, there's no way to to kind of uh, side side like build your deck to meta around it if you wanted to have reasonable win cons. But yeah. I uh, miss 
misspoke with cap shaker i meant claustrophobia which is the one blue blue uh, okay. tap down and it doesn't untap but yeah you're right like control magic costs two generic in in blue blue and claustrophobia is one generic blue blue there's not a lot of wiggle room with only one generic difference of whether you quote unquote destroyed a creature or stole a whole creature. Um, mm -hmm. And I think that yeah. claustrophobia, I think rarity plays a role there too, where I think control magic these days would be a rare, claustrophobia mm -hmm. would be a common, and I think useful pawn being a rare means that it's kind Between, of yeah. okay to be a, a slightly more pushed uh, claustrophobia. Yeah, juice, it. juice it a little bit, yeah. Okay. So Bradley, what card are we going to leave off on today? No pressure. <laughs> well, uh, let's go to MTG uh, dot Design Land. Um, we're going to end with some some flavor and lore. Pawn of Bolas. Okay, so there's a there's there's some sneaky things going on here. Um, well, first of all, good job redistributing all the. Uh, not just redistributing, but assigning all the colors here. Um, black and red both do fast mana, so we've got that uh, with the sacrifice. Um, and then the the card drawing is uh, there with the blue. However, the what's what's really peculiar and awesome is that this costs three mana to cast, right? So if you're casting this on curve and you got three lands out, sweet, and it has a tap ability required, so you have to wait a turn. So when you get to turn four. You play your fourth land, and, and you know everything's working out great because you drew all four lands. You got this. Uh, <laughs> most Bola spells are, 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 are actually all of them cost eight, um, or not all of them, sorry, cost eight or less. Uh, and uh, this enables you to cast uh, right on turn four the right exact time that you would cast many of these that co do cost eight. I know some cost less, but. Uh, I think that's wonderful, and and some of them do have a very heavy mana color requirement. So you're like, okay, this was actually also useful for the fixing. Wait, how are you casting an eight drop? Because you have four lands, and this adds three mana, right? Oh yeah, you're. Oh geez, my whole argument dismantled. No, well, <laughs> to be fair, the of the Bolas Planeswalkers that exist, this can cast Nicole Bolas God Pharaoh on curve. So that is still something. Okay, all right. Saved by the Pharaoh, I guess. <laughs> Dang it. <laughs> the flavor has been okay. All right, never mind. There's, um, I think there's one eight mana bolus, one nine mana bolus. No, oh, sorry, that's also eight. There's two eight mana boluses and one seven mana bolus, and then and a two, five, and a five. Yeah. The, yeah, yeah. All of them. If it were eight mana, yeah, all of them would be castable, but. Uh... But yeah, it, you know, maybe it's cool to also be able to cast um, an Elder Dragon spell or or just say Nicol Balas. It would be kind of cool to bring in the legendary creatures. Uh, oh yeah, for sure. Part as well. It would be really nice to be able to play this um, and have it work with the dragon versions of Nicol Bolas. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, or yeah. flip the flip Nicol Bolas. But I'm not sure how you get that all onto one card and have it be brief and not like pretty rough to read. Um, I do like that this, as well as the other black fast mana that we saw, um, earmarked stuff, because um, black getting fast mana is mostly historical at this point, but I think black getting fast mana specifically earmarked for black things, and Nicol Bolas is part black, obviously. Um, I think that, in my heart, should still be acceptable. Yeah, I, I love this as a callback to the previous uh, uh, Scourge Dog, whatever, because, hey, they still have 2-1 that uh, cantrips, still pretty good. Um, you And then you play it early, then you can ramp out a bolus. You draw this after you play your bolus, no problem. You're gonna you're still probably winning if, the, if you untap to the bolus, but then you get to get three more cards off of this, and it's like, oh, oh no, my opponent's really losing, so... Yeah, it, it's it's well balanced for whatever point in the game I draw this. It's still hype. Mm -hmm. I also like putting a lot of power points into this just in general. Um, there's this saying that like you should be incentivizing your players to do the things that they want to do, and I think that Nicol Bolas is iconic enough that people just want to be like slam jamming a Nicol Bolas and having an enabler to be able to 
have like a seven, eight, nine mana dragon still be relevant is um, is something that they want quite a bit. For sure. Okay. And with that, we're going to be wrapping up today's episode. Thanks, everyone, for joining me. Uh, before we head out... Oh, also, I, I minimized these and never brought them back up. Um, but yeah, thanks, everyone, for joining us. Um, once again, in the description, we have instructions for how to uh, submit cards if you want the chance to potentially be featured here. Thanks so much to Ancestral for setting up the mtg.design side of things and Cajun for setting up the LackeyBot side of things. Um, and yeah, uh, I don't think I have anything else to say other than see you tomorrow for day four dream. Do any of my guests have anything to say before we sign off? Look at the camera, if you imagine, with my finger gun and say, you rock, thank you. It's crazy that we're like averaging 200 designs a day. That's, and again, this is without any outreach whatsoever, which in the sense of like, we're not actively collecting the designs, we're having people come and submit them to us, which like, I think if we trawled Reddit, Twitter, other platforms, we'd have well over 250, maybe even 300 per day. So it's crazy the amount of participation we have this year. Can't do any of this without everyone just chipping in. So thanks y'all for that. I'm no mathematician, but I think that means that we're probably likely to end up with what, 6,000 or so total designs at the end of this? <laughs> oh, yeah, easily. That's... And if you haven't, to get there, if you haven't designed a card yet, it's not too late. And nothing says you can't go back and take your, you know, a stab at uh, one of the earlier days. So uh, do anything that you like. Uh, this is open ended and there's no rule that says you have to do all 31. Uh, just have some fun and uh, share it with the world. Yeah. And if you want your card to be part of something bigger uh, as part of Moxtober, I'm going to be making a cube with uh, the designs at the end of the month. But I'm uh, but stuff is still open till the end of the month because the, the MSC file is still open till then. MTD design pages too. So yeah, feel free to submit there and might see inclusion in the cube. But yeah, um, I think with that, uh, this is going to be Caillou, Bradley, Mark, and Ancestral signing off. See y'all tomorrow.